What a beautiful song. Good evening to everyone. It's good to see everyone back with us tonight. It is hot outside. I was told just a few moments ago, 106. It's still a beautiful day because we have the opportunity to be together and to worship God. I'm thankful for this opportunity to share God's Word with you. I am a little bit sad of the circumstances. I wish Spencer could be here preaching this sermon tonight. Uh, I have, just in the short time we've been working together, it's been a thrill for me. And he is certainly deserving to be in the pulpit and does a fantastic job. So let's continue to pray for Spencer. Now I've talked to the congregation several times regarding the book of Philippians. I love this book. It really motivates me and I hope it motivates you when you read it also to make sure that we live a life of love because in this book we're going to be challenged not only to love but to love even more. That church in Philippi understood the love that they were to have for others. And Paul, it's almost like a coach talking to his athletes and telling them not just to give but to give 100% but to give 110% to love and love even more than that. So we're certainly going to be challenged as we read the book to look at that. We're also going to notice the word over 16 times used in these few chapters in, Philipp in uh, the, book, uh, the Philippian book. Joyful is the word. Joyous is another word that comes about. Rejoicing is another thought that he has. But he's going to challenge us as Christians to live a joyous life. Certainly we need to do that also. Also, to live a life full of peace and comfort. That's going to be challenged through Paul to us today as the readers of the book. And to live a righteous life along the way. But one of the main themes of the book is Paul's going to challenge the readers to push other people in front of them. You've heard the word and you've believed it. You've repented. You've confessed. You've been baptized. You're walking the Christian life. Now, put other people in front of you so that they'll have the opportunity to hear the word and believe it, repent, confess, and also be baptized. That's one of the major themes of the book. Now that's confidence. That's confidence that Paul has in that church. It's confidence that that church has in Paul also. Paul uses terms in this opening that was read just a few moments ago by David to press on. That motivates all of us to understand that standing still is not an option. We need to constantly be moving forward. And Paul lay, has terms like laid hold of. We're going to talk a little bit more about this as we get going into the lesson. Because toward the middle of the sermon, um, I'm going to talk about Paul's conversion just for a little bit on the road to Damascus. But on that day, he was laid hold of. And we need to understand that's terminology meant to motivate us too. That we are shaken to the very core of our spiritual life. And then my personal favorite phrase that he uses is reaching forward to what lies ahead. Let's go back and look at the verses for a second. Not that I have already obtained it. Paul was still living it. He hadn't fully obtained the prize yet. That wouldn't come until the day he left this earth and stepped from this life to the next. He had not fully obtained it yet or have already become perfect. That word perfect can mean without mistakes, but it also can mean maturing or growing in Christ. And Paul probably is using it that way in this instance. He's continually maturing in Christ and challenges the readers to do the same. He says, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ. In other words, to grab a hold of, of it and not let go of that prize that's coming one day. And I think that's a beautiful thought that Paul has in trying to help people understand because that's exactly what Christ did to him, he says. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
that phrase, reaching forward to what lies ahead, can be summed up, I think, in a sports illustration. Go back when you were healthy, when you were in shape, go way back in your life. I have to go way back in mine to, to fit that il illustration. There's a football field. And you're on the football field. Your team's winning the game. They're winning the game because the team's playing as a team. Not individuals, but collectively together. The other team now has the ball. And they're marching down the field. They started on their 20-yard line, and now they're all the way down to the 30-yard line. Time's running out on the clock. It's just about gone. You have so much confidence that you know they're not going to run the ball. They're going to make a pass because time is going to be over after this play. And in your mind, you're saying, please, come my way. That's how much confidence you have. You're not bragging about it. You just know how much you've trained and tried to perfect your, your game. And you're hoping that the play comes your way because you have confidence. The quarterback takes the snap, fakes a handoff. You don't fall for it. He rolls around. Your person that you're defending, you're stride for stride with him. Everything's going your way. And then that player makes a little fake, and for whatever reason, you fell for it. And then he cuts across the flat, and he's wide open. And you haven't given up. You've doubled down. With every fiber in your muscles, you're running as fast as you can. And you're willing to make whatever sacrifice, because you know if you will continue at that level... Surely you're going to be able to secure the victory. The pass is in the air. It's coming that way. Without hesitation, you lay out completely in the air. You stretch your hand out as far as you can. You're straining. And you get enough strength just to nip the ball. Just enough that it throws it off course. The receiver can't catch the ball. And you secure a victory. That's the pressing forward that Paul's trying to convey. So I'm not here to talk about a sporting event. I'm here to try to motivate us tonight, just like Paul was trying to motivate those individuals in Philippi, to convey to the audience that if you're going to win, you're going to have to persevere and go beyond the finish line. Someone once wrote, No grace, no not the most sparkling and shining grace, can bring a man to heaven of itself, without perseverance. Not faith, which is the champion of grace, if it be faint and fail. Nor love, which is the nurse of grace, if it decline and wax cold. Nor humility, which is the adorner and beautifier of grace, if it continue not to the end. Not even obedience, nor repentance, nor patience, no, not any other virtue, except they have the perfect work of perseverance. I don't know if you agree with all of that or, or not, but the thought there that the author is trying to convey is the same thought that many of our well-established old-time gospel preachers used to tell us in days gone by. And that is, you must start the race well, but you also must end the race well in order to secure the victory. Many people in the Bible started the race well, but they didn't end so well. And I just want to give you a couple of examples real quick of that. You'll know this name, Judas. Judas was selected by Christ himself. Judas was one of the twelve in all the land with all the people. Only twelve people were selected. And one of them was Judas. And he began his race so well. We know at the end... He didn't end that race so well. We know he portrayed Christ. We know he took his life. And he's known today to us as the son of perdition because of that. But he began well. He didn't finish well. The problem was with Judas, 
we find someplace during that race, the devil entered him. Judas allowed that to happen. And the devil entered him, and he walked away from the race the way that he should have finished it. He never had that opportunity to do that. Another name that comes up is Demas. I don't know, many, many more people probably know the name Judas than they do Demas, but Demas is mentioned three times in the New Testament. He's mentioned upon his conversion, he started the race. He's running the race well the second time he's mentioned. Second time that he's mentioned in Scripture, he's traveling with Paul. He's teaching with Paul. He's a co-laborer with Paul. He's running the race the way that it should be run. However, the third time that he's mentioned, he's not ending the race that well. The third time he's mentioned in Scripture... The Bible simply says, Paul says it. He says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this world more. Demas began the race well. There's glimpses of him running the race well, but he didn't finish the race the way he was supposed to. Any one of us that's had the privilege to run a race, we understand that if we're going to... We both need to start it well, and we also need to finish it well... The middle part's the part that gives us the problem. And that's the perseverance during the race. It is the same thought that I tried to convey just a few moments ago regarding the football illustration. It's the same, uh, uh, same thought that Paul tries to convey in reaching forward to grab hold of the prize. Paul goes on to tell us a little bit about perseverance and that's what I want to spend the remainder of my time with tonight. If we are to be Christians who persevere in our walk with him, we must be willing to, as Paul put it, to embrace the true doctrine of Christ along the way. Can't be any other form of doctrine other than that that Christ has given to us. Paul says in verse 12, he expresses it this way. We must allow Christ, and, and the version that David read from said it, apprehend us, or lay hold of us, and the only way this can happen is if we embrace Him, and in so doing, we are embracing the truth of God's Word. A good definition of apprehend is to see suddenly and with great eagerness. A great biblical example of someone being apprehended is Saul of Tarsus himself. When he was on the road to Damascus, when that bright light shone on him and he fell to the ground, when he engaged Christ in that conversation, his life was taken and completely uprooted because he was shaken to the very core of his being because Christ laid hold of him that afternoon or apprehended him that afternoon. Paul's proof that being apprehended can lead us to great heights if we allow it to do so. He participated in many great works along the way. He was even called by some to be the chief apostle. But even though Paul was glad that his life had been apprehended by Christ or taken over by Christ, he still understood the struggles that he was going to have to go through. He understood that God never promised him a rose garden. He certainly didn't have one. For even though he called him, even though he was called by others to be the chief apostle, probably everyone in this room remembers what he called himself, and that is chief of sinners. Think about the two contrasts, chief apostle and chief of sinners. It's important to note that Paul knew that by the grace of God, he could be set free from his sins the shackles could be broken away from him. And it was only through that grace of God and his willingness to do what God asked him to do by embracing the true doctrine of Christ that he was going to be successful in finishing the race. Secondly, we should strive to reach forward and not dwell on our mistakes of the past. And I know that's easier said than done. Luke tells us, he that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom. 
But that's not to suggest that Paul never looked back. I think it would be a mistake to think that way. Paul constantly goes back and refers to his past in his preaching and teaching to others. But he doesn't do it to such a degree that he gets hung up in the past. And I think that's what the Bible's challenging us not to do. <clears throat> that we get so pulled backwards that we can't step forward anymore because of mistakes that we've made in the past. One step won't take you very far. You've got to keep running. One word won't tell folks who you are. You've got to keep talking. One inch won't make you very tall. You've got to keep growing. And here it is. One little deed won't do it all. You've got to keep going. The persevering Christian, like a sprinter, will strain and agonize and lean forward for the reward. And for a Christian, that's heaven. He will strive to gain, Christians will, full knowledge of Christ by doing everything within their power to come to a better understanding of God's word to embrace the truth not dwelling on the past but leaning forward just as a sprinter would in a race whenever you think of the 100 yard dash you know it's the shortest race that we have but it's also the fastest race that there is it's amazing to me that individuals can run that in around 9 seconds none of them as they're running that race, turn around and look backwards. Now you can do that in some races. But in that race, you're focused. And you're not focused just on the finish line, but you're going to shatter the finish line. You're going to run through the finish line. And right at the end of that race, you'll notice all the participants lean forward, almost to the point of falling down, straining to lean forward, to press on, as Christians, we can take that, and according to Hebrews 3.1, we can fix our thoughts on Jesus. Not on worldly things, but on Christ himself. As we lean forward toward the finish line. We should indeed do this. We should have great confidence, knowing that we can finish the race in such an order. Because there is a thrill to victory, point number three. And there is the agony of defeat. It is so discouraging to a racer, to a coach, to a fan, to see a runner pull up in the middle of a race. Maybe they trained well. Maybe they started the race very well. But for whatever reason, they just couldn't finish it well. All of that training, all of that preparation, all of that work, out of love, because you love what you're doing. But also out of sense of duty also. Not to let someone down along the way. I can get so much good out of that thought. To walk the Christian life. And to do it mainly because of the love I have for Jesus. But also like the whole book of Philippians is geared around that promoting others in front of you, the sense of duty that I have to others to finish that race, to promote them in front of me so that we all one day can win, win that great prize. They train not just to finish the race, an athlete will, they train to finish first. But for whatever reason, it just didn't happen. They quit along the way for some reason. Some might say it was because of the obstacles that were thrown at them. The burdens were just too heavy. Too much stress. They grew weary. They grew faint along the way. There are indeed many excuses that we can offer. The bottom line is they quit along the way. I would suggest... They didn't fully embrace the true doctrine of Christ to begin with. They continued looking backwards and getting caught up in their past mistakes rather than 
looking forward and all of those mistakes became obstacles to them along the way. They didn't understand how to finish the race the way that they should. Because they walked off the track, they never had the chance to receive the reward that was waiting for them. And if we walk off the track, we're never going to have that opportunity to receive that reward either. By walking off the track, quitting before they reach the finish line, they really robbed other people along the way to be able to look at their life on this earth and to be able to follow that example the way Paul intended in this writing and the way Christ intends for us as Christians to live. When we step from this life to the next life, in essence, we're kind of hanging up our cleats. But the life's lessons that we did while we were on this earth, just like Abel, are going to be around for years and years to come. You know, believe it or not, even in death, I could still motivate my children. And I could still motivate my grandchildren to do what's right. In other words, the athlete has a responsibility. When they finish the race to help others come to understand how to finish that race also. Unfortunately, many a people grow weary and walk away. Someone once wrote, Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. Sad, but he learned too late when he slipped down just how close he was to the golden crown. But now it's too late. We all have responsibilities. We all need to present ourselves just like Paul was encouraging us in such a way that we first take care of ourselves and make sure we're secure. And then, whatever way we can, we help others to run the race also. There could be a person in the audience tonight You've not become a New Testament Christian yet. And if that's the case, you can begin this race that Paul's talking about. You can begin it tonight by starting your race with Christ. But it also is equal, equally important to understand that there could be a person here tonight who started that race years ago. And let me do the positive first because it started it and they're still running it. And we're watching that person and we're gaining great insight on how to run that race. So for those that are doing that, thank you so much because you're setting such a great example. But on the other end of that, there are some who perhaps have stepped off the track. There's a lot of ways you can do that. There's a lot of obstacles. There's a lot of excuses we could use. But for whatever the reason is, you've stepped off. And we pray it's only momentarily. We pray that you will come back and get on the track again. Our prayer is, and we have a hope and desire that this be fulfilled tonight, that if you're not running that race the way that you should be running it, that you make the change tonight. Get back to where you need to be. Begin to run that race again with your thoughts fixed on Christ and the finish line and be faithful to that race for the remainder of your life. So if there's any way that we can help anybody tonight, whether in baptism or asking for prayers, we ask that you please come now as we stand and we sing. Let us reach out and give.